Welcome back to and finally our final part of the course in the next um, two or three lectures we'll see how this goes um, and it's part five and it's dealing with basically extended objects or what's so called rigid bodies and uh, first of all no it's not what you think <laughs> uh, rigid body just means extended body it just means an extended object um, as I always I always think physicists have a dark sense of humor in trying to name these things you know in so <laughs> um, with kinematics, no, it's not all about just collisions and people jumping off buildings. Um, free body is not about human trafficking and rigid body is not about dead bodies. OK, so um, it just means um, it just means now we have extended objects um, with some shape and it's not it's not elastic. OK, so um, a basketball is uh, or, you know, a football is not it's not a perfect rigid body. Um, and uh, a rock is pretty good, uh, good um, rigid body. However, so in this real, in the real world, there is no perfect rigid body. Everything, even a rock, ha it has a tiny bit of elasticity. Now, obviously, there's a spec whole spectrum between a pillow and a rock. Um, you want to be hit by one and not the other. Um, but uh, in a lot of good cases, um, even uh, even a basketball, uh, even a pillow, to be ex to be to be uh, perfectly frank, um, a lot of cases, as you can see, what we do, um, it, we can just approximate it as a rigid body first. And as physics goes, uh, this is basically how um, you, we have learned a lot through the first uh, four weeks of this course. Right, uh, we are basically on a quest to understand motion. This is the general theme of the whole of physics three A. And um, so far, um, hopefully you have seen the physicist's mindset is we have something complicated we want to analyze. So we start off simple, okay? We start off simple in some sense, everything is a zero dimension object. Um, for the first four weeks of the course, even though we have actual trains and trucks and cars and planets and boxes and apples and oranges, they are all approximated by a zero dimension object. Um, right? Just in case you don't know, a zero dimension is basically a, a point. Uh, a point without any size, a one dimension, um, just a little bit of uh, math trivia, zero dimension is a point. If you have two zero dimension objects, you connect it together, it's a one dimension object. So a line is one dimension. If you take two one dimension objects connected together, now you have a plane. If you have take two planes, which is a two dimension object, connect them together, now you have a three dimensional object. Um, if you take two uh, three dimensional objects and connect them together, you have four dimensions. I don't know how to draw that. I don't know how to visualize that. But if you're dealing with vectors, we talked about multiple dimension vectors. If you want a four dimensional vector, where that's easy <laughs> to a mathematician. There you go, four dimensions, no problem. In fact, they talk about n dimensions. Why, why, why restrict yourself to four when you can do n? Um, no reason. So, um, so to a mathematician, uh, uh, higher dimensions, no problem. Um, but for us, we'll stick with two or three dimensions uh, at most. Okay. So um, what we were doing is, even though when things are sliding down a slope, you realize that we analyze all the forces acting on it as if it starts from the center of mass of the object, even though it has an extent, even though it has an extent like that. Now, obviously, uh, this is a simplification. And however, like we said, the thing we want you to learn is sort of the not necessary the takeaway for the rest of your life. It's not necessary how to solve Newton's second law, although that would be a nice thing to have because you never know when you need it, right? Um, uh, but uh, if the really the real thing to take away from learning, right, why are we forcing you to learn physics um, other than taking the MCAT or whatever exams you might need to take, um, is because of the way of thinking. Right, so you have complicated problems. The physics is sort of the epitome of taking a complex problem and simplifying it. Yes, objects have size. Yes, object has has uh, has a shape. Maybe the shape, obviously, the shape will affect the the motion. And uh, the object might has an emotion. If the object is happy, it might run faster. If the object is, of, <laughs> um, I'm also object objectifying um, potentially. Uh, animals or people, um, if you know, we talk about runner running how fast with certain average velocity and stuff like that. If he's happy, he'll run faster. If he's sad, he'll run slower, right? But we are going to ex exclude everything and look at the look at the essence of things. And we'll start off with saying, hey, let's anything complicated, let's not worry about it, right? So um, does shape matter? Yes, but it's second order effect. If you want to care about shape, let me see. Let me ask you. Do you, is the 
taking into account of the shape easier or making the problem harder? If it makes the problem harder, we'll do it separately. Let's solve the easy part first, all right? If it, what's, what's easier than the, so everything so far, the objects only have mass. That's the only property any object has, if you realize the intrinsic property. It has extrinsic properties. So such as the, the, the kinematics properties, kinematics and dynamics properties. Kinematics usually, it's a bit to me as a semantics issue how you separate them, but uh, kinematics usually people refer to the position, that's a kinematic variable, um, uh, velocity and acceleration. Okay, so it's about its motion, dynamic is about its forces on it. So it has, these are external properties, right? The object's mass is not gonna change, that's an intrinsic property. Um, and in 3B, you will learn that um, once we have extended object, um, technically we could talk about it here now, but you'll learn it more in detail later on, um, is it will now, if you, things are extended, it will have a volume. And now um, we can talk about how much mass there is per volume and we call it density. Uh, and use the Greek symbol rho. So that's how much mass it has per unit volume, okay? The more mass per volume, per unit volume, the more dense it is. So that's how, that's the definition of density as you'll see in almost day one in 3B, all right? So it, it has other intrinsic properties. Um, technically, we could talk about it here, but it's just um, not necessary just yet. We'll focus on something else first. And uh, other things as well in 3B, you will start to learn, we'll make it, richer and richer, right? We'll start to make it more and more realistic to uh, real life. So in a lot of sense, you want to really master 3A and so that's the basic part, that's the um, building the foundation of everything, but just a little glance ahead of what's coming, right? Um, it, it would have thermal properties. Um, uh, th those are uh, other properties it can have as well um, and electrical properties. So it can have an electric charge uh, and stuff like that. All right, but we're going to still be simple in our question 3A and focus on it as mass. Um, but other extrinsic properties is its shape like that. And we're going to worry about it a little bit um, now when we're going to add to it, right? We're going to add it and make it more and more realistic. So that's kind of where we are going with this um, issue uh, uh, with our quest. Now, um, uh, we will talk about uh, when when we roll things down the slope, whether this is a sphere, whether this is a ring, a thin ring, a thick ring. So it's uh, uh, like a tire. Um, this is a thin, maybe just a ring like this, right? The different shapes will actually affect how fast it goes down the slope. In fact, you can make a uh, guess right now. We won't be able to answer this until next lecture, but you make a guess right now, right? This is a thick ring. This is a thin ring. This is a sphere. Let's say they all have the same mass. Which one will grow? Which one will grow faster? Will will it be A, B, C, or the same? Or or what? What other choice would, would there be? Right. So put it in the comments or in Piazza. What do you think? Uh, wh which one will roll down quickest? And we'll be able to answer this question. Um, either at the end of today's lecture or maybe tomorrow. We'll see how we go with this. Um, so the first thing we now realize is we'll, we will be taking into account of shapes, but the fact that it has an extended object now means that if it has a size, right? Let's um, make it, yeah, let me, let's make it round first. Now it, we, we, when we apply a force on this object, so for example here, um, yeah, the, we, gravity is applying a force down here and we know gravity acts from the center of mass or the sometimes called the center of gravity so the same thing right acts down from here that's called the weight um, but where is the contact force acting the contact force is over here right so um we we in in the all the first four parts of the course in the first four weeks of the course we were drawing the normal force from the center of mass and the reason is because every analysis we are doing we are not even worrying about the shape. We are assuming every, it is literally just a point. We don't care about the shape, all right? Now that we care, we actually have to be, be careful where you draw the force, all right? Um, this is a very common question uh, that students uh, ask you. So you might ask, uh, why not 
care about where you draw the force from the first place. And I'll answer that in a second, right? So for example, a pulley, um, when you have a mass over here and a mass over here, let's say, right, and it's hung uh, on the ceiling like this, where are you gonna draw the forces? Well, earlier we are just uh, worrying about what's called translational motion. So whether things move in a straight line or not. So sometimes called linear motion, linear or translational because it's straight, move in a straight line. Um, so all I'm worrying, caring about is, is this moving in a straight line? I'm not caring about whether it rotates or not. And if that's the case, everything, you could draw it literally from the center of mass. So it feels a tension over here. It feels a tension from this guy, so T1, T2, and the tension from the ceiling like this, okay? Now, it started, this is the only part of the course where we will deviate from this and actually draw the force over here because this is where the contact happens. This is where the contact happens. Let's call this box one, box two, um, and let's call this the ceiling, T from the ceiling. So this is T on the pulley. Let's be clear, actually, this is T on pulley from ceiling. This is T on pulley by one, by box one. This is T on the pulley by box two. Also see my general um, strategy of getting lazier and lazier as you write notes, but that's fine um, because it's obvious uh, in this case uh, what that means. Um, all right, so, oh, so this is in reality what's happening, okay? Now, uh, you, you might, uh, here's a good question is, uh, let, let's say this guy is more massive, right? So I'll draw this force larger like this. Now you might ask, well, if this is actually what happens, why in the first four weeks are we drawing the forces in a different way? Um, why not do this right away? Um, for two reasons. Number one is, if you draw it this way, it immediately raises a lot of, it's just a sort of a learning uh, strategy. Uh, well, if you draw it this way, it raises a lot of questions. Well, if this force is larger and this force is shorter, wouldn't it have a larger pull, right? Uh, force is a push or a pull. So it have a larger push or a pull on this side and this side when this will start spinning. And now this opens a whole can of worm of how fast does it spin? Um, does, does it contribute to the acceleration of, um, uh, of these guys, will, will it make this drop faster than it needs to be, etc. Those are all good questions. Um, however, uh, it, they also are difficult questions and we are going to tackle them in the next two lectures, right? Um, and before you understand a simple thing, um, asking all those questions, that will completely overwhelm you. And it's, not the, it's also not the physicist way of doing things. <laughs> we want to start with simple, um, and uh, go for it. And uh, you, so there's two answers to that. You might say, you, I can answer, well, we are only caring about the translation motion. So it, it's not easy to answer why that, why it stays still, right? So uh, it, it, uh, because you, you, uh, you, what, what happens is it will just cause it to rotate, um, but not move straight and down. And it, we will address all that in uh, coming lectures. So it's much easier to uh, maybe assume, you can either take the abstract view of assume this is just a zero dimensional point. I'm really addressing, does it go up or down? And the answer is, if, if it doesn't go up or down, then all the upwards force must equal to all the downwards force like that, because that's, that's what, me addressing whether it will accelerate upwards or downwards. Okay, so that's one answer. The second answer, and the second answer is on an abstract, more, more abstract, well, but uh, although abstract, but more formal point of view is um, we are uh, just assuming it is zero dimension. And you can actually approximate that by, say, by saying the radius uh, of the pulley is zero. Okay. Um, obviously, on real life, that's impossible. Um, it has to have a non-zero radius. Otherwise, it can it's not, it doesn't exist. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, but now we will, we will deal with the fact that now it actually has some extent like this, and how will it do? So now you realize what, 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 does, what does forces that do not originate from the center of mass do to an object? It will, it will rotate the object, okay? Um, as you can see, this guy um, is pulling it down this way. This guy's pulling up this way. So what it does, it's try to rotate it this way. Uh, fortunately, this guy's balancing it out. So it, it, doesn't, um, it, it doesn't completely sort of move off axis. It still stays on its axis over here. Uh, and it just rotates about its axis if that is larger than that. Okay, so we'll analyze all that. Um, but uh, hopefully now you can see 
the, re the reason why things rotate is because of forces not acting precisely at the center of mass, okay? Um, to, to illustrate why this would rotate, you can see the normal force is normal from the point of contact from there. So that's the, that's the normal force. Now the gravity uh, weight is acting from the center of mass of the object or the center of gravity of the object, right? So you see the normal force is starting from here. The gravity is starting from here. So gravity is trying to pull it this way. It's trying to move this point down here and this is trying to push that point up, what will it do? It will rotate about somewhere halfway like this. So it will start to rotate. So um, now what we have concluded, if we can write this down, is forces that don't act from the center of mass will cause rotation. That, so plural, if there's more than one force, that, well, technically, will one force rotate an object? If I just have one force, let's say I acted on here, it will still rotate the object, yes, yeah. Um, uh, and we will see that in a second, right? So forces that uh, do, so let's put parentheses, forces that do not originate on the center, of mass causes rotations, okay? So uh, as a result, the big part of this um, part five uh, we will uh, look at is rotational motions, okay? And at the very end of the course, we'll look at, so um, for the first part, we'll look at just the theory of why things rotate. So we'll look at the theory of, rotation. So the same question of why they rotate and how fast they rotate and how do we measure rotation and all that. But since now you are all experts in linear motion and translational motion, so linear or translation means the same thing. Uh, um, the, and we know why uh, the things will move in a linear way, and how to measure things when they are moving in a linear way. Basically, it's just forces cause uh, ch uh, change in velocity, right, or change in momentum uh, or acceleration. Um, and uh, kinematics equations will tell you, um, you can make measurements and predictions from there. Now that you've mastered that, what we have actually, we just need to change a small bit of things and we will be able to deal with rotations, okay? So that's the, uh, that's the idea. Um, so that will be very quick. And then um, once we understand that, uh, we will put them together in analyzing this final case. So that's why I will say um, it's either at the end of today or the uh, uh, beginning of next lesson, we'll be able to answer which one rolls faster because it's both a rotation and a translation. So uh, for the first part of uh, this part, <laughs> uh, first half of this part, we'll focus on things that just rotate and do not move at the same time and we'll combine them, but we'll realize um, once, because now that you mastered linear motion, rotational motion is again, just a small variation and you'll be done with it, okay? Now to motivate the first, uh, the next topic that we're gonna um, uh, do, right? That the next thing we're gonna first do before we jump into rotation is, I've talked about center of mass a lot of times, um, but now we actually have to worry about how do we calculate the center of mass? Um, this one's easy. Well, it's all spheric, it's sphe uh, spherical, so it's very symmetrical, right? So it's gonna be in the center. These are all very symmetrical. Um, how about if I have, um, if I have a rectangle, right? You intuitively think, all right, it's just, um, if I find a halfway point between um, here and a halfway point between here, draw a straight line, and that's the center of mass. Yes, that's true. How do you know, all right? Um, or what if the object is denser on this side than this side, okay? So if, the, if I, if, what, what if I put a block of M and 2M and 3M? like this, where will the center of mass be, right? For example, one kilogram, two kilogram, three kilograms, so what, something like that. Where's the center of mass? Um, so now we need to uh, understand how do you find that? And yeah, of course, you, now you might think, um, I just need to take an average. But uh, if things are not symmetrical, how do you take an average? So we're, in the next video, we're gonna learn how to do this. And it's called a weighted average. It's basically a more 
uh, improved, uh, uh, more upgraded version of average. Okay, so you'll be able to take a more powerful version of average. It's all. It's not only to find. It's a very powerful concept. Uh, weighted average. It's a very powerful concept. It's not only useful for finding center of mass, but a lot of real life applications as well. All right. But uh, yeah, we'll see that in the next video.